Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the future of accessible medicine and diagnostics. I'm Patrice Martin. I'm the co-lead and creative director of IDEO.org, and I'll be your facilitator this afternoon. Um, we are lucky we have an intimate space, so this is great for us all to just kind of dig in and have one conversation together. So two billion people lack access to medicine, especially in the developing world. It's estimated one child dies every 20 seconds from a disease that could have been prevented. Uh, today, we'll look across many aspects of this challenge and opportunity, from delivery to, to delivery channels, to supply, to research and development, to community engagement. And we're lucky enough to have an expert with us to speak to each one of those aspects. Um, and as the case with many of the sessions at CGI, um, there are typically as many experts in the room as there are up on stage. So we want this to very much be an interactive session with all of us. Um, so this is called a lab. For those of you who had not had the opportunity to be at a lab previously at CGI, what will happen is what I will bring up our panelists, our experts, one by one, they'll frame the conversation from their perspective, what's happening currently, and where they think rich opportunities lie. And then we'll actually put the conversation back to you. So everyone is sitting in tables. This will be your team for the day, in which you will then have the opportunity to react to what you heard, build on it, bring in other ideas, bring in your own expertise, bring in your own experience, and then really kind of codify your opinion on what you think is compelling regarding the future of accessible medicine and diagnostics. We'll then have you take those ideas back to our panelists and essentially flip the tables on how things normally work, and the panelists will be reacting to your thoughts and your opportunities. And it should make for a pretty rich and lively discussion. Sound good? Excellent. OK, so without further ado, let's get started. So this is, um, since we have a small room, we're actually going to do more of a hot seat format for our panelists. And I'll be calling them up one by one. Um, I'll just, it's OK. We're, we're all friends here. OK. So to start, we have Dale Nizankiza. How'd I do? Good, good. The CEO and founder of Village HealthWorks. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. So Dale, you're from Burundi, where you now lead Village HealthWorks. Um, and I wanted to start with you because I wanted you to actually frame up this challenge and this opportunity from the perspective of being in you know, the throes of what it's like to be in a place in which it's a very rural healthcare situation, in which access to medicine and access to diagnostics is a challenge. So can you give us your perspective on what's happening today? Well, thank you so much uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, first, I must uh, say that uh, we are in a rural area. It's not any kind of rural area. We are in a country that uh, uh, is called Burundi. And I say this because on so many occasions traveling between Rwanda and Burundi to the US, I was uh, asked by immigration officers looking at my passport, what is that? And I many times said, uh, it's Burundi. And one of them said to me, are you sure it's not Burma? I said, well, it was Burundi. So it's not any kind of rural area. We are in one of the poorest rural areas in the, one of the poorest country. So that, speaking of challenges, uh, we started uh, uh, in 2005 in rural Burundi uh, with the people who not only felt that they have been abandoned by the rest of the world, but also their own. Uh, mobilizing community members who were watching their own die at home or in the hands of witchcraft doctors. Uh, the community members donated the land, which the only commodity they have, to grow food. 
and they made the road, the first road linking the village to the main road to the capital city, so that if we are lucky, we could have uh, tools and construction material reach the community. Uh, maybe I should uh, illustrate this with an example. Uh, as uh, we were building this road and other community members making bricks with their own hands and digging stones and laying the foundation, there's one woman I saw in, uh, sitting in, uh, uh, under a palm tree. And she had a baby who was uh, sweating and shivering and, and round and on. And I asked her, uh, why are you here with the baby who's so sick? She said, look, this one is my fifth child. And he's the only one left. Rather than staying at home and watch him die, when I have nothing to do. It's important for me to come here and hopefully my contribution will help some mother's child. This one is gone. Uh, the process of building village health works in this rural area was very challenging for me after 11 years uh, outside of Burundi and going back to a country that has been completely ignored. Started bringing former enemies together because they noticed that they had nothing else left. Mm. So these former enemies not only became collaborators but friends and they started getting to know each other who they are as they're making bricks. Mental health, all kind of stuff, PTSD, it's very visible that you could see the love that they had each other, you know, for each other. So a year later, we opened the clinic, no electricity, no water. We had to just do whatever it takes and uh, save one life if we could, because if one life is saved, can save a village, can save a community, can save a country, and can save the world. Unfortunately, what we have seen, even though we have uh, today six physicians, all Burundians, a, an American physician who is uh, coordinating and uh, training and bringing other people, some of them said to me the other day, well, what a wonderful organization, but we are not going to operate under a tree, build the infrastructure. So we started that way, and uh, we have seen so many cases, the good and the bad. Uh, one is a community health worker who just uh, died in childbirth, uh, came to Village Health Works in the middle of the night. Even though we do prenatal care, we do a lot of uh, uh, advising and work with community health workers. We couldn't uh, uh, do C-section because we don't have that capacity. We have no surgical capacity. Drove to a hospital. There was nothing available to Bujumbura. The night was long. Was long. Finally, we got a physician to open the womb. Uh, the baby was dead. The mother didn't wake up, and we had to get two coffins back to Kigutu. So we're talking about demoralizing conditions where you have the knowledge, where you have the people who care, but cannot do what they want to do. And this is the reason why we are working very hard to build not only the healthcare system that is so badly needed in the country that has been off the map, but also to train local physicians, nurses, midwives, community health workers. We've been working with Partners in Health. Uh, DD Farmer, who is here, was the first one to train our community health workers and Paul Farmer. So there are a lot of wonderful things that can happen on when good people come together, like CGI, putting Burundi on a map, bringing good friends who have the resources, the knowledge, the skills to change life and strengthen communities. I have one question, one more question for you. Um, you've been doing phenomenal work to build this health system. Can you tell us about a recent win that you've had and how that's shaping your views on what's possible? Uh, first of all, again, it's really coming here to meet wonderful people, to share stories. He had a CGI, been a wonderful 
here are the challenges that we have, and here's how we see uh, things in Burundi. We need to strengthen the healthcare system. If Ebola was to teach us anything, it is a really a truly broken healthcare system. And uh, in the places where people actually are the most, so why can't we reach out these people? So at Village Health Works, we truly believe that uh, if we could help and work partner with the other people, and here's the, the infrastructure we need to build the women's health pavilion in the country, that is going to be the first one to train local physicians and others. That would be wonderful in the training and partnering with action. Action is really what is needed. So we are so lucky to have quite uh, uh, wonderful people who are supporting us and funding. Uh, this year has been uh, quite a lot uh, uh, and the good things happening where we are. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but as of May 1st next year, we are going to break the ground to build this 120 bed hospital to save mothers' lives. And uh, let me go. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Hotez, please join us. So Peter is the Dean and President of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College and Sabine Vaccine Institute. Peter, uh, you've dedicated your career to accelerate developments in global health and neglected tropical disease, especially for those diseases which primarily afflict the world's poorest and most remote populations. Um, if we just had Dale bring up Ebola. Wondering if you could start by commenting there. You know, what did you learn from this health crisis? Well, first of all, um, you're a tough act to follow. So. Uh, uh, thank you for your comments, and Sherman. I was very moved by your by your remarks. Uh, I'm back here now after a few years, uh, back in 2006 to 2008, at the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, working with CGI. We created a global network for neglected tropical diseases, which uh, takes medicines that are being donated by the major pharmaceutical companies, putting together in a package, in order to control or, in some cases, eliminate the world's neglected tropical diseases, which are the most common afflictions of poor people on the planet. These are diseases like elephantiasis and trachoma and river blindness. We're now eliminating three of those diseases to the point where we think they've these <coughs> this package started at CGI in 2006 has now reached 450 million people. So an extraordinary public health program launched here. I'm back this year talking about the need for the fact that we need innovation to make a new round of medicines and vaccines. And here we have a problem. The pharmaceutical company has been wonderful about donating medicines that they've made for another purpose and not repurposing them for neglected tropical diseases. But who's going to do the innovation to make a new generation of products? And we saw this absolute tragedy with the Ebola virus infection in 2014, where uh, 11,000 people died who didn't have to die if we had a vaccine in hand. The sad part is we had the technology for the vaccine a decade ago. The technology to make the Ebola vaccine was published in 2003, but it sat there. It sat there for more than a decade. Why? Because the business model is broken. The business model says an academic or a research institute develops the technology, you publish the paper, and you wait to license it to a major vaccine manufacturer. But of course, who's going to do that for a neglected tropical disease where there's absolutely no, there's no market? So it's a, it's a, there's a market failure there. So the technology sat there and sat there and sat there. Finally, at the 11th hour, past the 11th hour, at quarter to 12, uh, the US government through BARDA put up more than $70 million. There was a race. The vaccine was developed. By the time it was ready to use, Ebola was gone. So it was really showed that our technology to make products has outpaced our political, social, and financial instruments. So, so what's the answer? Well, there are 17 other neglected tropical diseases that the big pharmaceutical companies aren't touching. These are vaccines for diseases like schistosomiasis or leishmaniasis or hookworm infection, the ones that are not going to be controlled or eliminated through the mass treatments. So who's going to make that? Well, what we think is we need a new set of actors. The, what's great, what the big pharma does, they do some wonderful things, but we need another set of players out there who are going to be doing this. And I think the answer, or part of the answer, is what we're trying to do, which is develop products in the nonprofit sector. And this is done through organizations known as Product Development Partnerships, or PDPs. My kids call it Dad's Guaranteed Money Losing Company. but. 
we don't we don't like to use that term. So we use we call a product development partnership. So one of them is our Sabin Vaccine Institute and Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. We're in Houston, Texas, in the Texas Medical Center. And at Sabin now we've got a hookworm infection, a hookworm uh, vaccine that we've developed, and now it's in clinical trials in Gabon in Brazil, a new schistosomiasis vaccine. Uh, new vaccines for Leishmaniasis and Chagas disease uh, on the way. We're making the products that nobody else will make. And so I think it may not be the complete answer, but it's a way to start bringing in a new, new set of And vaccines. explain, I'd love for you to just go into this a bit more on PDPs. Explain to us the business model and how that would work. Well, well the, what's interesting about the business model is we're not quite certain what the end game is just yet. Uh, so we've been very good at going from discovery through process development uh, through pilot manufacture, IND filing with the FDA, uh, doing the toxicology testing, doing the lot release and the stability testing and the phase one clinical trials. We're now trying to figure out how we're going to get to the end game to licensure because things get more expensive, the trials get larger, it's for you to do a phase three trial prior to licensure. You also have the problem of the way you manufacture something for phase one material is often not as rigorous as the material they make for licensure. And so there we're actually talking with, with some of the big pharmaceutical companies, but also these interesting group of uh, vaccine developers, what are called IDCs, Innovative Developing Countries. These are countries that punch above their weight economically in terms of making products. So Brazil makes vaccines, China makes vaccines, India makes vaccines, Indonesia makes vaccines. And that's what we're trying to now work with them to do the final industrial scale up. Uh, for, to get these vaccines made for the world. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, next up, Eduardo Martinez. Eduardo is the president of the UPS Foundation. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to have you here. Um, so I want to start with a pretty basic question, but just tell us what the UPS Foundation is doing in terms of accessible medicines. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I first want to talk a little bit about UPS and UPS Foundation, how they sort of interact. UPS Foundation is the global citizenship leader for UPS, and we have four focus areas. One of them is humanitarian relief. And there we make investments in bilateral partnerships with five UN agencies and a number of NGOs and nonprofits in the US. And we really make investments in the preparedness, urgent response, and post-crisis recovery area. And we try to leverage, of course, the assets and the expertise of UPS, which operates in over 220 countries, has the ninth largest airline and 435,000 employees. So when some of something so dramatic as a sudden onset disaster occurs anywhere in the world, those are our communities too. And so we've converged essentially what we do philanthropically by leveraging the assets and the resources and the people of the company. And with respect to what is occurring today uh, as a result of Ebola, you know, we recognize, as all of you know, that for every dollar that's invested, 70 cents, 65 cents goes to the supply chain. When a disaster occurs, obviously the supply chain is broken or it becomes inefficient. When Ebola occurred, what we did is we leveraged these bilateral partnerships that we have with the CDC, with the UNHCR, with the World Food Program, and we basically contributed transportation services and most importantly, technology. But an in another interesting uh, really breakthrough for us came about is that we have a host of, of customers like Medtronic and other pharmaceutical companies that are also engaged with these same UN agencies and donating products. So what we did was we created a troika uh, among our customers that wanted to make donations and UPS that by virtue of our positioning in the supply chain can get those goods to these countries. What more could the private sector be doing here? I think the private sector can do a whole lot more. I think that what you need to do is you need to play to your strengths. So if we're talking about obesity, certainly uh, companies involved in nutrition, they need to be involved in those issues. For us, we think road safety, we think supply chain around humanitarian relief is our sweet spot. But I think the, the, the smartest way to give back to communities for the private sector 
is to do what they do best and combine them both. Can you give us just one last question before you're done? A, a specific example from UPS's work? Well, certainly our work around Ebola, uh, we collaborated with the CDC, with the UNHCR, with the World Food Program. We created a staging area in Europe that essentially supported the global cluster. So we had 40 organizations that made contributions. They carted it over to our Germany operation in Cologne, and we sent 10 flights for the global cluster into Ebola. Uh, you know, another, and I've got a little handout here, another uh, really test of this partnership with our customers was with Henry Schein. Henry Schein is the largest medical distributor in the world. And they essentially called us and they said, look, we've got gowns, protective equipment that we'd like to donate. We connected them to the CDC and then we transported the material into the uh, Ebola theater. Uh, so, th I mean, th those, are, those are examples and certainly uh, what we're doing now in the refugee crisis, we've been involved really for the last three years, uh, sending uh, uh, life-saving commodities into uh, Lebanon and Turkey and Jordan on behalf of UNICEF. So again, we're, we're sort of flexing our muscles in areas where we know that we can impact. And certainly, certainly supply chains in Africa around the distribution of vaccine is an area of great opportunity. Uh, so my hope, and, and we were talking earlier, is to continue working with our customer's base. Well, we work with Pfizer, we work with Merck, and they make donations to Gavi and the Global Fund, and we work with those organizations as well. But between the three of us, working with national systems, I think that we can improve the supply chain uh, in many parts of the developing world that, that are struggling. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Next up, we have Charlotte Erzball, Corporate Vice President of Novo, of Novo Nord Nordisk. So Charlotte, uh, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you for being here today. Thank you very much. Uh, Novo Nordisk and PATH committed to reducing preventable morbidity by addressing the availability of medicines and technology for diabetes in low and middle income countries. What barriers in procurement and supply have you been able to break down, and how have you done this? Well, first of all, um, just to, to say a few words about why we went into that Please. partnership. Um, Novo Nordisk su is supplying close to half of the world's insulin supply. Um, and for many years, we have had a, a differential pricing policy, making insulin available in these developed countries um, at an affordable price. And in those 15 years, we've seen that that's not the only part of the solution. Actually, um, many countries are not making use of the facility. Um, and um, it's not necessarily the affordable price that the end consumer, the patient, will be left with. Um, and also due to many issues in the countries. Um, and um, we wanted to try and understand that. Um, and what was the, the underlying reason for that and what the many barriers were. Because in many countries around the world, in, these, uh, in particular in low and middle income countries that have been battling with um, so many other disease areas, um, HIV and AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis, right now they are facing a, a double disease burden. And uh, clearly they are not prepared for that. So by entering into a collaboration with PATH that has been working to try and, and mainstream the, the care of non-communal diseases into the, the mainstream uh, healthcare system in those countries through innovation and technologies, we thought that we could maybe uh, create a new type of transparency into what the real issues were. Um, and there are many issues. Um, there are issues around the fact that Diabetes and other NCDs are not really on the radar um, at the government level. Um, there are issues in terms of procurement, um, maybe the fact that uh, it's, there's not enough uh, medicine and technologies procured. Um, we also know that often the insulin will be stuck in some warehouse uh, in the capital and uh, may uh, even uh, 
go off its shelf life um, and, and, and people not getting access to it. And particularly in, in areas, in, in rural areas in many of these countries, patients will not be able to access this insulin. Um, and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, a child diagnosed with diabetes that doesn't have access to insulin will have a medium survival time of two years. So this insulin is an essential medicine. Um, and with the collaboration with PATH, we, we came to understand that in order to really address this issue, we need to work across the value chain. We need to look at distribution, we need to look at procurement, we need to look at financing, we need to look at um, the whole spectrum of, of diabetes care. It's not just the insulin, it's also the medical technologies. Um, and, and we need to bring many different partners to the table. Um, and a couple of years ago, we started a, an innovation project uh, looking at how we could create a business model at the base of the pyramid. And our hope was that through this collaboration, we would get some new insights in terms of how we could accelerate that project um, and, and into um, many more countries across the, the African continent. Tell us a bit more about that project. What have you learned? Well, what we've learned uh, is that um, you, well, you, one of the things that we've learned actually is that we need to figure out how we, through the distribution chain, can ensure that the, the price that the patient is left with is the affordable price. So for, for example, in Kenya, um, we have printed the price on the package and we have negotiated with the distributors, uh, ensuring that there are less uh, steps along the way from our X factory price to the price that the patient will pay. Um, we've also been collaborating in Kenya, for example, with faith-based organizations um, that have the infrastructure to reach out to, to, uh, to the community. The other thing that we've learned is that there's a huge education gap in these countries. Um, there are a lack of doctors. Um, the former president of the International Diabetes Federation, Jean-Claude Mabanya, who is the, a professor of diabetology at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon, he, he's told me that if you enter the HIV and AIDS clinic in my university hospital, it's a first world clinic. If you enter my clinic, which is a diabetes clinic, it's a third world clinic. But that's also where we need to, to figure out how we can integrate NCDs into the well operating facilities that have been established for, for some of the communicable diseases. L last question, what advice do you have for pharmaceutical companies who are looking to increase their involvement in this space? Well, I think that the important thing is to really get to grips with what the real problem is. Um, a, a, it, it was a quick fix, if you want, for us to say we will create a differentiated pricing policy and, and lower the price. But that didn't fix the problem. So it, it, it's, it's a much more complicated and complex undertaking. So it really requires that you work with the governments in these countries and you understand what their ambitions are, priorities are, the healthcare infrastructure, uh, and bring the different stakeholders together uh, around this. And, and I think one of the big learnings is that we can't create parallel healthcare systems. There's one healthcare system, and we need to bring the capacity up um, across the different disease areas that they're battling with. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte. And last but not least, Jacob Gale. Jacob is the Vice President of Medtronic Philanthropy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to have you. Uh, so Medtronic Philanthropy aims to expand access to healthcare for underserved populations around the world, especially those with uh, chronic conditions. So from your perspective and perhaps building on all of the comments of the other panelists, how has a lack of affordable and adequate diagnostic tools affected the health, safety, and security of many of the poor and low-income countries? Well, so if you can't diagnose and if you can't um, become aware of what the health challenges are that you need to respond to and confront, then it means that you don't have the opportunity, as others in the world have, to um, as we talk about, alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. Um, just to you know, just to give a real quick back, backdrop, so you have an understanding of why it is that Medtronic even cares about this, is that back in 1931, there was an eight-year-old kid 
whose parents allowed him to go to a mo the movies by himself for the first time. And the movie that he went to see was a movie called Frankenstein. So if you know anything about Frankenstein, you know that electricity brought Frankenstein to life, and there's a whole story to that. Well, believe it or not, that inspired this kid to eventually get a PhD in electrical engineering. And when there was a need to build a pacemaker for a child in Minneapolis, Minnesota to keep him alive, Earl Bakken, Dr. Earl Bakken at that time, was able to build that pacemaker and keep him alive. It's out of the box thinking. The fact that um, Frankenstein was written by a teenage girl also made a big difference in recognizing that medical technology um, is very important to have diversity of mindset, thought, and clearly gender. I say all that to say is that disruptive innovation is really the key to what is needed to make sure that diagnostics, um, medical solutions, and technologies are available to all. And that is how the world's largest medical technology company developed and in meeting its mission has to help with other partners, as was said earlier, to make sure that we do provide whatever we provide to one side of this planet, we're able to um, provide to all in need. It takes disruptive innovation, out of the box thinking, Frankenstein-like um, thought and behavior in order to make that happen. Once we are able to develop affordable diagnostics together with affordable treatment, then we're able to begin to do what we know we need to do to meet that 25 by 25 goal of reducing the unnecessary deaths related to non-communicable diseases by 25% by the year 2025. So let's say on the um, technical and technological thread for a moment, what's, um, what's on the radar, what's on the horizon that it's particularly exciting you in regards to this issue? So the thing that most excites me about what is on the radar is not necessarily technology, but I think it's the way that we are approaching things in an innovative process. Recognizing that, first of all, just like we learned in the HIV AIDS um, movement and issues, people who are living with non-communicable diseases are, have to be at the forefront of our thought our understanding of the challenges and needs, and ultimately coming up with the solutions. And so not trying to export what we know from a first world setting in order to fit into an underserved, but really getting into underserved communities worldwide. They're everywhere. They're not too far from where we sit right now. They may also be on the other side of the planet. But to better understand what the needs are, using that out of the box, disruptive, innovative thought process to figure out how to best respond to those, and then really building a business model that sustains our efforts to make a difference. Can you, can you expand on that? Is there an example from a community where they've really led an innovation process on how a technology is created, or a solution is created, or adapted? So in India, uh, where we recognized by going through various communities of need that one of the challenges that was confronted was related to hearing that for whatever reason there might be, community, um, folks from community raised the concern that there was the, the impact on hearing was, um, was important for us to learn more about. So we did some studies. We thought what we could do is if we could do a franchise model of training community health workers to clean ears that, you know, at the railway stations and on farmlands and this and that, that this would make a difference. Well, what we found out through the process was that there was actually um, a larger issue than just cleaning ears that needed to be uh, dealt with. Both the development of diagnostic tools to be able to better understand what the nature of the problem is, um, the engagement of community health workers, people from the community who had access to individuals and access also to the healthcare system, and then ultimately it, development of technologies and solutions. And so the Shruti program um, in Hindi, I Hear program, is a program that now has had much success across various parts of a very large country and now spreading throughout South Asia. One of the most recent greatest developments of it is the Shruti is also coming to rural North Carolina. So to recognize that these, these challenges and the disruptive innovations that make a difference um, can really be beneficial worldwide.